Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this webinar entitled Imaging of the Pediatric Thyroid, Practical Tips and Newer Technologies, presented by Dr. Janet Reed. The AIUM is accredited by the ACCME. This webinar is designated for one AMA PRA Category 1 credit. By the conclusion of this webinar, participants should be able to discuss the more common congenital disorders of the thyroid, list the imaging features of typical forms of thyroiditis, and describe the features on ultrasound for malignancy. As an ACCME accredited provider, it is the AIUM's policy to ensure that the contents and quality of this activity are balanced independent, objective, and scientifically rigorous. All individuals who are in a position to control the content of an educational activity are required to complete a disclosure form. All disclosures are reviewed by the AIUM and any conflicts of interest are resolved or managed prior to an activity. Janet Reed and Darcy Belito de Luna have no disclosures. At the conclusion of this webinar, you will be able to access the CME test located on the AIUM website. Participants who complete the post-test with a grade of 70% or higher will be awarded one CME credit. For more information on accessing the CME test and claiming credit, please refer to the handout provided in the dashboard on the right side of your screen. Credits for this webinar are approved for physicians, sonographers, and radiologic technologists. During today's presentation, if you have questions for the presenter, you may type them into the question box on the right side of your screen. You will be able to submit questions throughout the webinar, but the presenter will not begin answering until the end of the presentation, at which time she will answer as many questions as possible. A recording of this webinar will be available on the AIUM website. And now I'm pleased to present Dr. Janet Reed. Okay. And Dr. Reed, we cannot hear you. So that's my dogs. Um, I'm going to present my screen in one minute. How does that look? That looks great. Fantastic. Well, um, good afternoon to the group. Um, it's very, I'm honored to be here and thank you for inviting me. Um, we will be talking about the pediatric thyroid and sharing some of the newer information and newer technologies uh, that we're employing and that others are as well. I did present this at the AIUM meeting in March and uh, and it, I think it was well received. And even after that, some new information has been uh, received. So here we're going to go through five different aspects of the topic of the thyroid gland and in particular ultrasound. And first we'll start with anatomy and technique. This is important as um, some of the thyroid disease can lie in various locations within the thyroid and one must be thorough in understanding the anatomy and some of the sometimes anomalous aspects of the thyroid that can be missed. It is important, uh, especially from a pediatric perspective, to understand that the thyroid does descend along the anterior neck from the level of the foramen cecum, that would be above this image, at the base of the tongue and it comes down to form two lobes. And sometimes, and there is an isthmus, which is the bridge, but sometimes there is this pyramidal lobe, which is this sort of extra extension, which is still part of normal thyroid. We know that it lies just below the thyroid cartilage seen here in red, and it lies over the trachea and to the medial aspect of the jugular vein and carotid artery on either side. These anatomic landmarks are important when looking at thyroid disease. The thoracic inlet is at the inferior aspect and the hyoid bone is one other important pediatric structure to recognize and it's going to sit up above the thyroid cartilage and something that one must look at with ultrasound for certain conditions. 
let's look at what the clinical indications are for thyroid ultrasound. First, uh, one of the things that we'll be looking at is structural disease. So as in the adult population, uh, we will be looking at masses. Uh, the patient may present with a clinical examination that shows enlargement or goiter. There may be pain in the neck or there may be uh, suspicious adenopathy. So those are very, very common reasons for us to look at pediatric thyroid. In fact, that probably is the bulk of the cases that we uh, image. But looking on the other side, we can see patients who present because of a systemic problem. So they have had a thyroid hormone test or a TSH and it shows low or high thyroid, or there's a clinical manifestation for same. Remember that all newborns have a heel prick and they will have thyroid function tests done at birth. And so those will be picked up right away and we will be able to know that these patients have congenital hypothyroidism and will need to scan the neck to figure out the cause. Understand also that there's a whole cohort of patients with genetic syndromes that we see. Um, these also, of course, uh, will grow into adulthood and you'll see them as well when imaging adult patients. Uh, but there is a whole cohort of uh, patients who have what's called cancer predisposition syndromes. And many of these syndromes uh, will predispose to cancers in addition to thyroid cancer, all a bunch of other different cancers. So these patients will have routine surveillance. And then finally, there's the acute lymphocytic leukemia population that undergo total body irradiation, and they are at increased risk for thyroid cancer, and so they will be part of our regular um, visit to ultrasound. So let's look a little bit at technique, and some of these images are taken from a series of technique videos that we have uh, published, and they demonstrate um, sort of some of the standard ways to image the thyroid that should be useful both in adults and in children. First off, we will be looking at the thyroid using grayscale, but also color, including power Doppler. We will always measure the normal anatomic structures and also the pathology. And then of course we have to look at the nodes. So if we look at the positioning of the patient, even babies, we will position in this extended neck position. Keep them modest by covering uh, them with some drape or towel. And under the neck, there is a roll placed so that the neck remains extended so that we can best see the thyroid. In babies, this is very challenging, as you know, because the size of the neck, the length is very, very short relative to the head. And so you really need to try to hyperextend them as best you can, sometimes having a parent lie underneath the baby and having the baby drape the head over the parent's arm. As far as the positioning uh, of the transducer, we can see here the first image that we obtain routinely is the transverse image of both lobes. And we'll look as in this anatomic drawing really through the mid pole and across the thymus. Uh, the, sorry, the isthmus. The second image is a sagittal right-sided image through the right lobe, and we'll obtain the longest image and obtain our measurements with this. The second image is uh, orthogonal to this, and it's a transverse of the largest region of the right lobe, and then we perform cine images through in the transverse and the sagittal plane to complete this. And the same for the left. And then the far out right, so that we're at the um, internal jugular vein carotid artery bundle where the lymph nodes will be sitting. And we'll talk about the different lymph node stages that we'll want to look for. And we'll see, uh, look and see if nodes are there. If present, we will image them. And then we will, uh, in the report, comment on their character and their size. And again, the same on the left side. Let's talk a little bit about thyroid elastography. Elastography is something that really we're borrowing from the established literature for breast nodules. And the technique that we use is using shear wave that uh, will render both a quantitative and qualitative assessment of whatever, what, uh, whatever you're, you're looking at, whether it's the thyroid lobe itself or a node or a nodule. We do know some of the basic principles of elastography will say, that stiffer tissues will render faster uh, velocities, and so the shear wave velocities will be faster. In Europe and other, uh, on other systems, you'll see that these are rendered in kilopascals. When we look at the uh, rendering that we obtain on one of our machines at our hospital, 
we'll see that we take a sampling of 10 different velocities within the region of interest and we will then have these charted and then an average velocity will be calculated. As well, we're rendering a color map which gives up the, us the qualitative evaluation of the pathology that we're looking at. We know that the normal thyroid is relatively soft, but unfortunately still we have no determined standards for children for the thyroid gland, unlike in the liver where we have some, some good established standards now. We do know though that in thyroid disease, in general, diffuse diseases will be firm and nodules tend to be firm. And also understand that malignant calcifications will distort um, they will really distort the physics of elastography and artifactually make the values either higher or lower than they actually are. Looking at these two examples that we have uh, for a qualitative, a quantitative assessment, I'm sorry, a qualitative assessment or a color map, we can see that the range here over here on the left shows the reddish and yellowish colors are soft and the bluish and greenish colors are harder. We can see in this benign follicular adenoma, which is this well-marginated lesion here, that it renders very soft colors. In contrast to this confirmed malignant papillary carcinoma, which is this nodule here, and you can see there are several little calcifications within it, this is a very hard nodule. Note that then in the region of calcification, we have some artifactually softer areas, and this is just because of distortion, because of the calcifications. Let's look at contrast. Uh, this is bubbles injected intravenously and then um, using the bubbles and uh, time intensity curve to evaluate the bubble character and amount in the thyroid gland and look at it and how it behaves within thyroid nodules. And this study was done um, and published in 2017 by Zhang and it really looked at a whole number of, a good number of patients with uh, 319 nodules, 75 of which were malignant. Their reference standard was tissue or FNA. And there was a cohort of, of younger patients, but these were by and large um, older patients or adults. They did look at their scale was either um, rendering these, these contrast patterns as either low contrast, equal contrast to adjacent thyroid, higher, and then circular patterns. And what they found was with looking at the nodules and just using TIRADS criteria per adults, that they had a pretty high negative predictive value for nodules that were malignant. Using contrast, the negative predictive value was not a lot different, but the two together rendered very high negative predictive value and also high sensitivity and high specificity. So their conclusion was that adding contrast ultrasound to the TIRADS characterization of nodules significantly increased the diagnostic accuracy for cancer. Remembering uh, also part of the report is that uh, the lymph nodes must be reported both in character uh, and also in size, but also to use grayscale, Doppler, and, and as well as measuring these nodules. One must know this map. This map is um, from Dr. Som, who has done a fantastic amount of work in in uh, mapping these, and this artistic rendering was from one of his publications uh, in AJR 2000. And we know that each of these stations is well-defined by its adjacent anatomic structures. It helps us in our department to just have a picture of this um, hanging up or accessible on the computer with descriptors for each of these stations. We know the most important stations for thyroid cancer are going to be the two, three, four, and five but don't forget six that lies out midline, and this is the visceral nodes that sometimes can become involved in metastatic disease. So let's look now at some congenital conditions. Uh, the congenital conditions are fascinating, um, and we can do a, play a good part as radiologists in uh, defining what is going on. I did talk to you and address this briefly, that uh, this is a patient to, uh, who is now two years old, but did come in with congenital hypothyroidism. And the ultrasound's really important uh, for this being one condition. 
looking at this ultrasound, we can see that, in fact, um, here's this blown up picture that we've got the trachea here and really what should be thyroid tissue at that kind of midline view where there should be isthmus, there's really nothing except for uh, muscle. So what, what happened here is we go uh, and place the thyroid, the uh, ultrasound probe a little bit higher in the neck. And this is what I was talking with you about earlier. This is the hyoid bone here on this sagittal view of the upper neck. And we can see that we have strap muscles here and we have this tissue that looks very much like thyroid gland. And we go ahead and do a transverse view in midline. This is sitting just above the hyoid bone, this very sort of homogeneous tissue that looks very much like thyroid. And uh, there was no thyroid in the neck. And so this patient went on to a pertechnitate scan. We can see this is a lingual thyroid, which should uh, be characterized by these key points of absent thyroid in the neck sublingual thyroid tissue and a confirmed thyroid activity on the protectinitate scan. So lingual thyroid. Any lingual thyroid needs a detailed thyroid ultrasound before they go ahead and operate. This is another patient now is truly a newborn now and the newborn check shows hypothyroidism and we can see that going through the neck very similar appearance. We really don't have anything that looks like thyroid tissue, just muscle. Uh, there may be a little lymph node here but there's really nothing in the jugular vein and carotid artery on either side. So this patient went on to the protectinate scan and this one shows really no activity at all. And this is an aplasia of the thyroid, a pretty uh, difficult position, uh, condition to have and you must identify this early. The role of the radiologist therefore is to say, is there any tissue there at all? Um, and, and if not, they need to be on replacement hormone immediately. This one obviously won't resolve and will be on replacement for life. In contrast to this patient with congenital hypothyroidism, and you can see these are vastly different cases. This patient came in with congenital hypothyroidism on a lab test and a neck mass. So on their exam, they felt more than they should in the area of the thyroid and didn't know what they were feeling. We can see on this grayscale that there's a enlarged, not lobulated, but homogeneous appearance of the thyroid gland, which really doesn't have any hyperemia on the color Doppler. In this case, uh, special testing, including the free T4, shows a high free T4, and then thyroid peroxidase antibodies are high. And these are antibodies that render autoimmune thyroid disease in babies, and they are uh, liberated by the mother and they result in a homogeneous goiter and hypothyroidism. So in summary, we have uh, this entity known as congenital hypothyroidism, which is uh, really very uncommon to begin with. And for the, ma the vast majority of these patients, or 85%, this will be due to some kind of mechanical lack of development of some sort. And you'll be able to see that anatomically on ultrasound. So the radiologist becomes very important here. In 15% or less, it is a dishormonogenesis problem or a biosynthesis problem, or it's an error of metabolism or transport. These can be genetic, they can be acquired as was seen in the last case, and those things will basically be ruled in when the anatomic abnormality is ruled out. Note that ultrasound is highly specific for lingual thyroid, but it doesn't have very high sensitivity. And that all in all, it's very important to identify the normal gland on ultrasound because they will stop replacement hormones at three years um, as a trial if there's actually a normal gland like the one I showed you, but it's just not functioning normally initially because the antibodies may kind of dissipate over time. So let's go ahead and look at this one, which uh, in fairness, they said this child had a neck mass. In fact, I'm looking at the left side. The neck mass was felt on the right. Well, actually, if you're going through the left, you see no thyroid. But on the right, there's thyroid. There's even a bit of isthmus. So this one's a bit of a trick. This is actually a thyroid hemiagenesis. They can render the patient hypothyroid because there's less thyroid uh, tissue to make thyroid hormone. But they can be euthyroid as well. They may have the isthmus or it may be missing, but they also have an increased incidence of a pyramidal lobe. So this is sort of an abnormal migration and abnormal development condition. Uh, another condition of a lump in the right side of the neck. This is a patient who has a pretty uh, homogeneous looking lump on this sagittal image. 
that on transverse image is very homogeneous. And we note the typical through transmission, we can see that there's increased echoes in the deeper tissues because of enhanced uh, velocity of, of the ultrasound beam through this uh, really bland liquid. So this is a cystic lesion that is seen on sagittal and transverse view in the midline, and it is related to the hyoid bone. It is actually touching the hyoid bone. And this patient um, went on to MRI uh, because I guess there was a, going to be surgical planning and the surgeons felt more comfortable with this. And we can see that this is actually touching the hyoid, but it's actually extending above the hyoid and is slightly septated at the floor of the mouth. It's slightly to the left, but was felt to be uh, midline on physical examination. And we can see down in the neck, neck here, we have a normal thyroid gland, which you would want to do with ultrasound. You would not need the MR for this. So this is a patient with a thyroglossal duct cyst. It's midline, it may be complex or it may be lobulated, but most often it has some internal echoes and it's often solid or sorry, solitary and not septated. They are midline or near midline in the majority of cases. And there may be relationship to the hyoid. And this is important because it leads to, it helps the surgeon in their definitive resection and planning their surgery. In contrast to this 16-year-old who has intermittent neck swelling, and you can see there are more internal echoes in this lesion. This lesion is pretty high in the neck, um, and we can see on this transverse view, it has even some little ring down areas of colloid. But this again, it's a midline lesion, and this is a thyroglossal duct cyst. Um, and, and as mentioned, my experience is that these more often than not have internal echoes and they may even appear solid. There may even be ectopic thyroid tissue within these. So don't let the internal echo texture um, kind of sway you against this lesion. Also, elastography may be helpful because this will be very soft. So in summary, uh, the abnormal development of the thyroid gland and the role of ultrasound is that it really is important in the setting of congenital hypothyroidism to find the normal gland. And so if you see aplasia, ectopia, hypoplasia, or unilateral or bilateral agenesis, you're going to know what's causing this abnormality. In the absence of this, you must be able to identify the goiter and characterize it in infants. Um, there are a couple of different causes for this, either that due to thyroid peroxidase antibodies, and that's an autoimmune thyroiditis that may be able to be weaned in time, or a dishormonogenesis. Note that the anatomically normal gland with abnormal thyroid function is usually a genetic disorder of biosynthesis or transport or function. So you can see the ultrasound is very helpful in sort of differentiating these conditions. We're going to look now at inflammatory uh, diseases and we'll look both at focal and diffuse diseases and many of these will have crossover with adult ultrasound of the thyroid. We'll look first at this patient uh, who came in with these endocrine studies. Uh, the patient's TSA was markedly suppressed and their T3 and um, the T4 and T3 were very elevated. And over time, we saw that these things started to normalize. Putting an ultrasound probe on this patient's neck, um, this patient with hyperthyroidism, shows a pretty bland looking or homogeneous looking um, enlarged thyroid. And we can see it sort of looks like that baby with the congenital hypothyroidism. Uh, this bland look, however, shows that there's marked hyperemia within the gland. Some people even call this an inferno appearance. But I'll tell you, I find it's not always that easy that in this case it's classic, but sometimes difficult to differentiate between our two most common causes for hypo hyperthyroidism. This one is a Graves disease patient, and you can see that's homogeneous appearance with the inferno pattern on um, scanning with Doppler is said to be characteristic, it's said to be classic, but it isn't always going to be the case. I don't think you can really hang your hat on the appearance on ultrasound and tell them exactly what is the cause for the hyperthyroidism. In contrast to this case, which is again a classic but may not always be the pattern, I find more often actually with this condition, this is heterogeneous and it is pseudonodulated. And so we have a 13-year-old girl with goiter and these pseudonodulars 
appearance will be seen on top of a, an enlarged thyroid gland. There may be areas of hyperechogenicity and even what's called a white night nodule within here. These can be hypervascular or they can be low in vascularity depending on the level of function. So I'd call that an inferno too, but uh, the, the, the Doppler doesn't usually help as much as the echo texture on grayscale. So in autoimmune or Hashimoto thyroiditis, it's important to recognize that this pseudo nodular appearance with or without hyperemia is is a problem because there's a greater incidence in these patients of underlying malignant nodules in, and in particular, it's papillary carcinoma. So your surveillance for these Hashimoto patients is to look at the gland, look at the size, and then try to pick through and see if you see true nodularity or any change over time. So they, you have to be kind of meticulous with these. And in contrast to this condition, and again, this is more common than we give it credit. This is a nine-year-old with precocious puberty and cafe au lait spots, but they also have this kind of heterogeneous looking thyroid with sort of variable vascularity. And cafe au lait, precocious puberty, and a hormone problem such as this should be Macuna albright. Uh, they may have bone lesions as well non-ossifying fibromas or uh, fibrous dysplasia. And so these patients can present with goiter. It can be homogeneous or nodular. And the thyroid is actually the second most common endocrinopathy after um, adrenal abnormalities. So it's important to recognize that these patients with a Macuna albright can have thyroid disease. Let's look at an interesting uh, condition that is particular to children and something that we see probably a couple of times a year. This is a, a patient, a clinical image is from a patient uh, who is five years old with intermittent left neck swelling and fever. And you can see on this kind of oblique view and then this frontal view that there is a mass in the left side of the neck. It's not particularly hyperemic. I don't see redness. It wasn't hot. There was no bruy over it. So we put an ultrasound probe over it and you can see a pretty nasty looking um, heterogeneous fluctuant lesion. It even has a bit of air in it and it's over here very intimately associated with that left lobe of the thyroid on this grayscale. The right side is normal. And so if we look at the history, this patient's had this happen five, six, seven times in the past, and it's always on the left side. So this is an unusual situation. Um, it's hyperemia here, uh, hyperemic here, um, kind of confirming that it's an, an abscess. This is an unusual condition, uh, but it is related embryologically to the development of the pharyngeal pouches. So here on endoscopy, they went in and they got into the piriform sinus, and then they got into this long track that went right down and right into the left lobe of the thyroid. This is a piriform sinus fistula and suppurative thyroiditis, which we're seeing here. And um, it is a recurrent phenomenon related to the fourth branchial pouch, and it's a persistent sinus or fistulous tract from the fourth branchial pouch to the thyroid. This needs to be recognized first and dissected all the way down to the thyroid in order for it to resolve. An interesting conundrum in the newborn. So you get the roll under the neck of the baby and you extend the neck and you're scanning the thyroid and you find a pretty normal thyroid and you go, oh no, there's a mass at the base of the thyroid. What the heck is this? And if you look carefully, this mass is actually a normal structure. It has the echo texture of liver. It will always sit at the base of the thyroid. You'll never see it above the thyroid. And if you just take your probe and continue down, and of course, children have cartilaginous costochondral junctions anteriorly and adjacent to the sternum, you can scan through the cartilage and you can see that this is actually continuous with the thymus. It's going to be a little sort of like a pyramidal lobe of the thymus. It's hypoechoic, it's separate from the thyroid, but it will be continuous with the thymus. And this is an older patient, a 14-year-old, with a nodule inferior to the thyroid on a scan. Again, this is a lobular thyroid. This patient had hyperthyroidism, so there was a concern for underlying potential malignancy. And here's another one. This is also thymus, seen in two views. 
So in summary, looking at inflammatory conditions and the role for ultrasound, first to determine if you've got a diffuse versus a focal process, and it, although not completely something you can hang your hat on, determine whether you're dealing with a homogeneous goiter or so-called Graves disease, or a pseudonodular goiter, which you'll see in Hashimoto's. Less helpful is the hyperemia or storm that one, se one sees more commonly with Graves' disease. In summary, you can see hyperemia with any hyperthyroidism. And it's important as well in the setting of autoimmune thyroiditis to look for underlying nodules or tumors. So let's look a little bit, dive deeper into the thyroid mass or the utility of the TIRADS classification. So this is what we're talking about. It's a 19-year-old patient with a hyperplastic nodule. Now, looking at this thyroid sort of on first glance, I really can't tell you if we have a hyperplastic nodule or not. This was a follow-up study, and I had the benefit of time and also tissue. This patient has a pretty normal looking thyroid, but has a nodule in the right lobe, and there are some colloid cysts as well on the periphery. It's a relatively homogeneous thyroid despite this. And so here's the nodule here, here it is here, and we can see on color Doppler that there's peripheral but no real central hyperemia within this nodule. There's really nothing from this that can tell me if this solid nodule is tumor or is benign. However, there are some patterns that one can try to follow in order to assist um, the radiologist in trying to figure out if this is benign or malignant. Another rule of thumb would be to watch these over time and absolutely do a fine needle aspiration if there's growth or get a fine needle and confirm the uh, pathology or the histology. So with benign nodules, this nice paper out of AJR in 2009 looked at a number of adults again, uh, most of them were women, which is, more, which is most common with benign nodules, and uh, we had 64 men. There were 500 nodules. They used the reference standard of fine needle aspiration, so histology was the reference standard, and of those, only 20 of them were malignant. They picked out four patterns um, that uh, were really almost confirmatory of a benign condition. And the four patterns I will show you now, uh, again, do not rely on this, but use it as your guide. The spongiform pattern or the puff pastry pattern as seen here, and this is a, sort of a polka dot with a lot of polka dots within the nodule that are sort of uniform in size. So the spongiform or puff pastry pattern, uh, benign. A cyst with a colloid clot, this is a cyst, this is colloid here, kind of looks bland, benign. A giraffe pattern, this is a little harder for me, but apparently stripes in here and like regions of, of kind of geographic, well, there's stripes and separating spots. Apparently that looks like a giraffe. Um, so I have a little more hard, harder time with that one, but that's considered benign. And then finally, we have the Hashimoto's white knight. And this is a little hyperechoic nodule that can sit on a bed of pseudonodularity. And its hyperechoic pattern is a little bit more comforting than the microcalcification pattern that you might see with papillary carcinoma. So it's uniformly bright. Uh, there's no through transmission in it. And this is the white knight benign. So you're given this case, and it's a complex cystic lesion. Um, I do know this did undergo aspiration just because it was quite large. And this is actually a colloid cyst here. Um, if you took away all these septations, you'd say this was the typical colloid cyst or colloid plug and benign. In contrast to this case, which is a 12-year-old with a thyroid nodule that um, is suspicious. We're looking here in sagittal. And we have the color Doppler for comparison on the split screen. And we have a transverse. And this is transverse of the left neck here. 
vascular bundle here, and then this is actually a lymph node out here. So let's characterize this. This nodule is got multiple little calcifications. It's not that well defined. There's hypervascularity within it, and we'd want a measurement of this as well. We can see it on both planes, but more worrisome is this lymph node has the same characteristic calcifications as the nodule that is in the thyroid gland. Very concerning, and one needs to run the complete neck to figure out where the rest of the nodes are. We'll talk about nodes in a few minutes. Here's another look at some of the other nodes in this patient once the neck has been run, and we can see this is also very suspicious. It's got the general shape of a lymph node. It's a little plumper though, a little rounder than you'd expect, and it has none of the normal internal architecture. In fact, it is probably necrotic, and so then there may be little calcifications within it, another very suspicious node. This patient went on to MR and there were multiple nodes on that left side of the neck. And this is a uh, metastatic papillary carcinoma, which has um, a solid appearance, is generally hypoechoic compared to surrounding thyroid. And this nodule looks like it has some components that are hypoechoic. It has small calcifications that are probably erroneously referred to as micro calcifications. They are visible on ultrasound, so they are macro, but they're small. And the nodes are going to show some suspicious findings. Um, in this case, round, no central hilum, necrotic or cystic, and calcifications. Let's talk a little bit about metastatic nodes, and it is sort of like the talk about, about uh, malignant nodules. The more rounded appearance and loss of the normal fatty hilum are two concerning features. Uh, cystic appearance or necrotic appearance, small calcifications, and hyperemia or variable blood flow within one node concerning. And then finally, enlargement is another concerning feature as seen in these cases. This is a patient who has another condition, a 13-year-old boy with multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2A, and he's having a screening test, first test. So he has a lot of family members with cancers, and this is his first test. And so we have the distinct pleasure of diagnosing this um, unfortunate condition. Very irregular hypoechoic nodules with small calcifications. They are rounded. And we see them bilaterally, in this case, taking one side of the neck. We see a little bit of surrounding hyperemia and variable blood flow within these nodules. If we look further out in the neck, um, and these are up at uh, level two and three, we can see these little calcifications and hyperemia within these things that could very much just be this nodule here. This is metastatic disease into the lateral neck. And this was a metastatic medullary carcinoma of the thyroid. Note it looks fairly similar to the papillary, so I don't think you can get down to a histologic diagnosis on your ultrasound. These are solid, hypoechoic, with microcalcifications, um, and are often multifocal, as in this situation. We also had the clue that he had MEN2A, and so this is going to be part of that syndrome. The nodes will have a very similar appearance. Looking at um, this recent paper that came out of uh, Sick Children's Hospital in Toronto, which is uh, really an, our best look now at how to look at children's uh, no, nodules in the thyroid in children and determine malignancy, and how to use the adult criteria to try to put these into some sort of ballpark and get some kind of accuracy. Well. This came from the truism that cancer of the thyroid is two to five times higher in children than in adults. And so their question was, can the ATA or the American Thyroid Association and the TIRAD system in adults be used to determine likelihood of malignancy in pediatric thyroid nodules? Great research question. So they had a good number of patients, 124. Uh, these were res retrospectively reviewed. Uh, they use all the standard protocol in scanning these patients, so there wasn't much variability. They did inter-observer variability assessment, and they had a follow-up and standard histopath at two years. 
sorry, two-year follow-up and standard histopath. And they had 52 malignant nodules. And what came from this was, um, and these are the children's and, sorry, these are the adults versus the children's numbers. We see the positive predictive value on ATA and the TIRADS for the adults and the children is really not very different. And so their conclusion really was, um, although it would be nice to see that there was something better or something greater that came out of this, it's still useful that we as sonographers can use the ATA and TIRADS classification system because it's similar to adults, albeit imperfect, and neither is sufficient to discriminate the likelihood of malignancy. Looking at this nice paper out of Hartford, Connecticut, and looking specifically at a modified McGill score, I'll just draw your attention to this, which is the central portion of this table one in the paper. And uh, what is important here is that they found that the patients with higher scores, so more than 11, had a sensitivity of 80% and a specificity of 100% with a positive predictive value of 100% for malignancy. So if you look at this cohort, and it's a good size uh, cohort, the things that are most important from this table are the size of the, the nodule is very important. So anything over two will render two points. And if it's over three centimeters, it's three points. And over four, it's four points. So size of the lesion is one of the most important things. The presence of lymph nodes that are abnormal is important with two points. And an enlargement, greater than 30% enlargement of the lesion over time, and again, it's going to be variable depending on what your time interval is, that's going to give you more points. And calcifications. So these are very important things to think about. You also will get points for its hypoechoic appearance versus hyperechoic, or the white knight that I showed you, and also increased vascularity, the lesion taller than it is wide, and also coarse calcifications. Those are also important to note because they each get one point. Finally, reporting on thyroid disease in kids, and it's in particular thyroid nodules. Uh, we do employ a structured report, and we will um, draw, we're able to draw the nodules on our report in, um, in our system and show where they're sitting. And we want to show the measurements in three planes. And we're also going to want to talk about the character of the lesions. So it, for each nodule, we're going to want to check off the boxes for each of these features that are some of the features that I mentioned on the slide prior. So we also want to measure, um, we want to measure the isthmus and we want to measure the lobes. We want to look at the echo texture and we want to use all of these criteria for suspicious nodules, including numbering them to make it easier for those going forward for the follow-up studies. Again, pull out SOMS map and know that these are all the stations and the description for where these things are. Go ahead and copy and paste this and put it up somewhere so you know where these things are. And then when your sonographers are following these things up and the radiologists are interpreting this, you know where you're looking and you can compare apples to apples. Marking them on the diagram is nice if you're able to do that within your structured report. So in summary, looking at thyroid masses and the role for ultrasound, we are determining several things. One is to look for background disease, because knowing that papillary carcinoma, for instance, is more common within autoimmune thyroiditis. We need to enumerate these and show the location on a map, if possible, and obviously measure these and then characterize them using some of the criteria that were shown. Lymph nodes should be counted and should be characterized, and only suspicious lymph nodes are reported. Our reports do not include multiple normal post-inflammatory lymph nodes were found because every child has that. So it would be like saying, you know, the child has hair on his head, which most children do. We, we, we eliminate that. But with a caveat for all of the, having, well, all of what was just said, this quote by Cooper in Thyroid, 2009, with the exception of suspicious cervical lymphadenopathy, which is a specific but insensitive finding, no single sonographic feature or combination of features is adequately sensitive or specific to identify all malignant nodules. So that's the sobering note. I'm hoping, though, from this lecture, you have 
picked up a few things, um, some of the classic features of developmental abnormalities. Um, I used maybe one or two sentences from embryology and that was it. And that's really all you need to know to understand some of this. And that you have, if you haven't already, uh, that you try to employ an ordered imaging approach to optimally characterize focal and diffuse disease. And that there's a structured report that allows you to provide a complete and useful report to the referring physician. The report of nodules for children really sh could and should now, uh, following that 2018 paper, follow the ATA and TIRADS classification system, and that the results will be similar to adults in predicting malignancy. I want to thank this group for listening in today, and I believe that we have some time for questions. Darcy? Yes, we have one question at the moment. Um, do you see it appear on your screen or? I probably minimized everything on my screen. Okay, so. well, we've got a question from Canada asking which method are you using to characterize your nodules? We are using a, a combination, really we're using the McGill criteria um, without formally calling it that and working with our thyroid, our endocrinologist, we are, um, we basically have a list just as I showed on the McGill criteria and on my summary slide and we basically just check off the features from that. Okay. And, and then, where in Canada? Where in Canada was the person because of course that's where I'm from. That I don't know. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, I see the question now. Oh, okay. Is, okay. Oh, so I see questions now. This is awesome. Okay. There we go. You can take over then. There, it was Claudia Martinez Rios. She was one of the authors for, uh, for that paper. And so she's listening in. Oh, excellent. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And so her comment, and this is, so the, the, the uh, questions are, um, there's several things in here. And it's interesting how this is stacking them. Great talk, Dr. Reed. Greetings from Canada. Uh, which method? Are you considering a size threshold for peds? We are not at the moment. And again, a lot of this is going to be determined by the people you're working with. And it's very interesting having worked at several institutions where um, we aren't always all in sync or in step with what we're doing. Uh, so again, this talk is not meant to be the gospel. It's just one center's perspective. Um, and, and her comment was the McGill score nodules are larger. And um, how is a significant change in volume of a nodule uh, defined? Well, we have a volume of ellipse and we, um, we measure the volume of the ellipse and then we measure it again at follow up and we look at the percent change from that. Um, Claudia again says the ATA recommends smaller sizes. So again, there's work to do and her group has done the best work so far in their recent publication that I encourage all of you to look at. And uh, we look forward to seeing more from your group, Claudia, and I look forward to seeing you as well. Do we have any final questions? Going once. All right, well then I, I believe um, Thank you very much, Dr. Reed, for this wonderful presentation. And on behalf of the AIUM, our thanks to all of you who participated in today's webinar. Please remember to complete the post test and the activity evaluation. And we hope you enjoyed this presentation and will join us again for future webinars. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>